actions have consequences in the real world. Your moral actions bear fruit in the real world and they have real moral consequences. And sometimes the things that you do in this body live on and they bear fruit. We like to think of this as a religious concept, but let's put it into real world terms. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And we like to think of that as a religious, oh, that's a very religious concept of sin. No, it's not. Let's think of it this way. Somebody abuses a small child. Seven-year-old boy is being beaten by his dad. That is death. That is death being produced in that small child, in that moment, in the real world, in real time. If you don't think that is actual, literal death, Ask that kid when he's 35 years old because he will carry those sins around in his body till the day he dies. Ask him. You don't believe me? Ask a 35-year-old man who was beaten as a child. Never get over it. Never. Carry it around with him till the day he dies and it bears fruit. Throw out the concept of sin as some sort of religious concept and think of it as just an evil act. Uh, uh, you smack a small child, you hurt him. It's an evil act. It happens in the real world in real time and it has real consequences. Somebody has to pay the price for the deeds that are done, that are moral in nature, that violate the sovereignty of other human beings. There are two types of sins. There may be more, but for the purposes of this conversation, there are two types of sins. Sins of the flesh, you do by yourself. Those are your own business. That's between you and God. Those don't hurt anybody but you. And the sins that you act out on other people, those are not between you and God. Those require justice of some form or another. You smack up a small child, seven-year-old child, who pays the price for that sin? He does. Who walks out the death produced by that sin? He does. And he'll walk it out till the day he dies. Justice requires that somebody pay. Somebody other than the victim. You're starting to understand the real world application of justice? Because the victim will pay. They will bear the fruit of your evil deed against them till the day they die. They will carry the consequences of your act and it will affect their relationships when they're 30 years old or affect their relationships with their own family. The family that they may have may affect their relationship to their wife. It may affect them in ways that you can't even fathom. Evil acts against other people have real world consequences and they bear fruit in the real world. And justice requires that somebody pay. Now, is the person who did it guilty? Maybe. It's not, it's not that easy of a question. Technically, yes. But if you look into the soul of the person who, who abused a small child, let's take a wild guess at what happened to him when he was a small child. Let's just take a wild guess. It's not that complicated. The Bible says the sins of the father will be visited upon the son from generation to generation. You pretend like it's some sort of mumbo-jumbo fake concept. It's the real world. It's real life. The sins of the father will be visited upon the son from generation to generation. 99 times out of 100, you see somebody beating a child, take them aside and say, what happened to you when you were younger? Guess, what's going, guess what you're going to find out. It's not rocket science. The sins of the father will be visited upon the son from generation to generation. Because the real world the evil has real world consequences. It produces moral anguish in the individual. And that moral anguish gets acted out in their life and never leaves them. Unless they know how to heal from it. Unless God willing, God help, to they somehow, you know find peace and work it out of their soul. Other than that, the sorrow produced in someone when they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, the just injustice visited against them, they'll carry that around with them for the day they die. So who pays for it? They do. Who pays the consequences for those sins? They do. 
But absolute justice requires that people be punished. Absolute justice demands a blood sacrifice. Why? Blood happened. Blood happened. Real world blood. Now, was the person who committed the evil act guilty? I'm not 100% sure. You're not 100% sure. We don't have all the information. Only God knows for sure. Only God knows for sure whether that person had what, whether the, what was done to them when they were younger. You know, I know a woman who was abused horribly when she was a child. I can tell you stories that make the hair on your arm raise. Honest to God, how the hot poker felled up against her face. Was told, I'm going to burn that pretty little face off. I swear to God. Was told that when she was seven years old. Imagine you're seven years old. Someone holds a hot poker to your face. Tells you they're going to burn you for life. She was locked in a closet. Or locked in a shed in the backyard. Sometimes for eight, nine, ten hours at a time. Guess what? That woman was horribly abusive when she became older. Horribly, horribly, horribly abusive. Was it her fault? I don't know. I don't know. And neither do you. That's why God and God alone will sit on judgment on human beings. Because only he has all the information. Only he knows all the things that went into producing what you see today in present tense. Evil that people do today in present tense has, has beginnings. They didn't come out of thin air. Seeds were sown. Those evil seeds were sown somewhere back in their past. Now, I knew that person in real life. Very difficult person. Very, 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 very complicated, difficult person. And she did her own version of bringing death and ruin into my life. Let's just say she was pretty, pretty close member of the family. Rest in peace. Was she guilty? Was she guilty? I don't know. You tell me. You have empathy. You're a reasonable human being. How would you grow up if you had had a hot poker held to your face when you were seven years old? How would you be as an adult? Would you be a healthy, well-adjusted adult? Doubt it. <laughs> would you be an abusive monster? Probably. To what degree? I don't know. Only God alone can tell you to what degree that is within someone's control and to what degree it is not. To what degree that person had ownership of their soul and their behavior and to what degree they are not. Even our courts decide things that way. Not guilty by reason of insanity. Or not guilty because they weren't in control of the situation. They weren't completely in control of their faculties. The point is justice demands payment. Justice demands judgment, wrath. But a loving God and a fair God wants to also give mercy. A loving God and a fair God wants to also give mercy. So God is faced with a conundrum. Perfect justice demands that the person pay for the evil act. The woman in question was abusive as a real-world adult, horrendously abusive as a real-world adult, and her abuse bore consequences in the real world in her children. Justice demanded retribution. Justice demanded that, that she be hurt for the harm she caused. Mercy spoke a different language. Look at how she was raised. How could she do any different? How could she be anything other than what she became? Where is she actually morally accountable? Who can really know for sure other than God? Who can really say for sure other than God? So what does the cross allow God to do? Both. That's what it allows him to do. It allows him to form, perform an act of vengeance in real time against Jesus. God is allowed to express his wrath and his fury and his anger in real time against Jesus and let the abused abuser go free. 
and let the abused abuser go free. Seen correctly, it's perfection. Seen correctly, it's perfection. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but seen, understood correctly, there is perfection in it. Perfect justice and perfect mercy. I promise you on that. Amen.